Jews did not long survive the crucifixion. Under the Emperor Titus, they rebelled, and Titus captured Jerusalem and commemorated his victory on his triumphal arch at Rome. Then about 50 years later, the Jews rebelled again, and the Emperor Hadrian captured Jerusalem the last time and raised it to the ground so that not one stone was left upon another. Meanwhile, Christianity had become a sect in the Roman Empire and was being persecuted. And the scene of many of the martyrdoms was the Colosseum at Rome. Now you are inside the Colosseum and in a minute on the ground floor you will see the cages from which the lions were let loose upon the early Christians. There are the cages in the middle. Though the empire began, it was through the great trade routes of the empire that Christianity first spread. This map shows you one of St. Paul's journeys from Antioch. He went north through Asia Minor to Troas, crossed over to Macedonia, to Thessalonica, to Berea, and then went south to Athens and Corinth. And from Corinth he crossed the sea again to Ephesus, and so went back to Caesarea Jerusalem and Antioch. And when the Emperor Constantine adopted Christianity as the religion of the empire, churches sprang up everywhere. Great ruins like this, once a vast Byzantine church, but now miles out in the desert from anywhere, give one an impressive idea of the extent of the early church. It is a weird sight to see this beautiful brickwork now surrounded by, no by nothing but a few Bedouin tents, and only the home of hawks and lizards. In Jerusalem itself, Queen Helena, the mother of the Emperor Constantine, built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You can see it here, the two black domes in the centre of the picture, and just to the left, the square crusader tower. In this closer view, you see the scaffolding, which is now shoring up the building, because it is thought to be falling down. You also notice how the roof of the church merges with the roof of the city, and is built all over the site of the hill, or what is thought to be the site of the Hill of Calvary. But more than anything today, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre reflects the divisions which so soon split the early church. Under this great rotunda, or dome, five different churches hold five different services in their five different languages at the same time. And they all own separate sections of this dome. Each pillar is owned by a different church. And unfortunately, there have been many disputes as to the rights of property here. The haze is the haze of incense, which sometimes is so thick it makes it impossible to see a cross. And on the left, the tomb itself is coming into the picture, fronted by great candles. The services you see are the great Easter ceremonies filmed for the first time in the history. This is the Latin Mass in front of the holy tomb itself. The Latins in Jerusalem are, of course, the Roman Catholics. Here is the Latin Patriarch. The Greek Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Patriarch, whom you will see in a round mitre, is the Bishop of Jerusalem. The priests are in cloth of gold, and they process night and day through Holy Week. The Armenians in their pointed hoods with great beards. Their robes are some of the most beautiful of all. These are crimson and cloth of gold. And they carry palms for a procession on Palm Sunday. This Syrian Orthodox bishop is reading the lesson in Aramaic, the language which our Lord himself used. And these are the Copts, the successors of the ancient church of Egypt, entering the tomb. You notice the great candles flanking the door. These five churches hold their ceremonies inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Outside on the roof and at night, the Abyssinian Church is allowed to hold its own services. And these perhaps are the most picturesque of all. To the syncopated beat of the African drum, umbrellas of state, once used at Addis Ababa, are carried round and round the roof of the rotunda, while the priests themselves search symbolically for the body of our Lord. And the abbot follows in a mitre of solid gold. Yet it was just the divisions which produced these several churches, which also 
in about the 7th century provoked the reaction of Islam. We can still catch something of the spirit of Islam from the great processions they hold today in memory of their victories. This procession here is in honor of the prophet Moses, who is a Muslim prophet as well. And you can tell from the way they are brandishing their swords how fervent the Muslims still are. When the Caliph Omar con conquered Jerusalem, he built this great mosque known as the Dome of the Rock on the site of Solomon's Temple and instead of the Church of Justinian. And from then, with the brief interval of crusades, the minaret dominated the holy city until the Great War. Pilgrims were still always allowed to come to the city. The Jews to wail at the foundation stones of Solomon's temple and bemoan their past glories. The Christians to attend the ceremonies in the courtyard or the church of the Holy Sepulchre. Here is the Greek Orthodox patriarch blessing the pilgrims. And the pilgrims them themselves are wiping the dust from the dais onto their handkerchiefs to take away with them as mementos. The castle of Schobeck, 50 miles south of the Dead Sea and built on the top of a barren mountain. This is Belfort, nearly 300 miles to the north on the Litany Valley, and that is the back view. Athlete, 50 miles north of Jerusalem on the coast and visited by Richard Coeur de Leon. It was largely destroyed by an earthquake. And this castle we have been unable to identify, but it is miles away from anywhere in the desert and today I think visited only by aeroplane. Yet it gives one an idea of the loneliness of these crusader outposts. But in the 12th century, Saladin conquered them again, and from that time onwards, the minaret of the holy city, and ruled it until the Great War.